now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Comedy on this Saturday with episodes of Bob Hope, The Magnificent Montague starring Monty Woolley, Jack Benny, Vincent Price in Speaking of Cinderella on the CBS Radio Workshop, and an episode of Claudia. That's all straight ahead on this Saturday. This is the 6th day of April, 97th day of the year, 261 days until we get to 2025. John Tyler inaugurated on this date in 1841 as the 10th President of the United States. Celluloid patented on this date in 1869. In Athens in 1896, the opening of the first modern Olympic Games, 1,500 years after being banned by Roman Emperor Theodosius I. In 1909, Robert Perry allegedly breached the North Pole. Perry's claim disputed because of failings in his navigational ability. In 1917, the U.S. declared war on Germany. In 1926, Walter Varney Airlines made the first commercial flight. Varney, the root company of United Airlines. In 1931, Will Rogers started broadcasting the Will Rogers program on radio. And in 1931, Little Orphan Annie debuted on the Blue Network of NBC, uh, which would later become ABC. In 1938, Teflon discovered. And in 1962, the Seattle World's Fair opened. All of the fair in Seattle, too. And a galaxy of fun in the gateway. Seattle World's Fair, here we come. The World's Fair, officially known as the Century 21 Exposition, it boasted nearly 10 million attendees, and it actually made a profit. The launch of Early Bird, the first communications satellite to be placed in synchronous orbit on this date in 1965. In 1976, during the Democrat presidential campaign, Jimmy Carter almost derailed his path to the White House by opposing integration for integration's sake. I have no nothing uh, against a community that's made up of uh, people who are Polish or who are Czechoslovakians or who are French Canadians or who are blacks from trying to maintain the ethnic purity of their neighborhood. This is a natural inclination on the part of people. Now, Carter did say he supported open housing laws that criminalized the refusal to sell or rent based on race, creed, color, or ethnic origin, but Carter was forced to back down. 1983, Secretary of the Interior James Watt banned the Beach Boys from performing their annual 4th of July concert on the National Mall on the grounds that rock concerts drew an undesirable element. To ignore the, the, the great majority of the American public who enjoys rock music is, is just sheer stupidity. We attract uh, parents with children yeah. at our concerts at this, the same time. You know, we're, It's a very middle-of-the-road kind of band, and I'm really... Surprised. I, of course, Watt always makes me embarrassed. I'm a Republican, but that's my own problem. Al Jardine and Bruce Johnston of the Beach Boys. In 1987, Sugar Ray Leonard went the distance to win a controversial 12 round decision over marvelous Marvin Hagler at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. Tonight was a special accomplishment for me. Yeah, it was a special accomplishment. And I respect everyone's opinion and personal viewpoints of the fight. But this fight meant the world to me. I'd like to extend a congratulations to Marvelous Marvin Hagler for giving me the opportunity to make history. The 29-year-old Leonard returning to the ring from a five-year forced retirement and had been warned he was risking his sight by fighting with a detached retina. In 2017, U.S. military launched 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles at an airbase in Syria. Russia described the attacks as an aggression, adding they significantly damaged U.S.-Russia ties. Passing away on this date in history, Prince Rainier of Monaco. His Serene Highness Prince Rainier III has ceased to be among us. Death has torn him from his family and his people. Prince Rainier was 81 at his passing in 2005. He had been married to screen star Grace Kelly until her passing in 1982. 
Also passing away on this date, Sam Shepard, Igor Stravinsky, uh, sci-fi author Isaac Asimov, the Plasmatics Wendy O. Wilson, musician of uh, country musician Tammy Wynette. Also, Mickey Rooney passing away on this date, Merle Haggard, and Don Rickles. And I got to tell you, I still swear he's funnier than a lot of people today, and yet he wouldn't be allowed to perform because he insulted people. So sad. Birthdays on this date include broadcaster Lowell Thomas, musician Jerry Mulligan, uh, composer Andre Previn, also Ivan Dixon from Hogan's Heroes, and country's Merle Haggard, all born on this date. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. Birthdays today include actor Billy D. Williams, who turns 87. The Invaders, Roy Thinnes is 86. The master of the pan flute, Zamfir, is 83. From Diner, The Natural, Good Morning Vietnam, Bugsy, Rain Man, film producer, director Barry Levinson, 82. Cliff Claven from Cheers, John Ratzenberger, 77. From Taxi, Mary Lou Henner is 72. From The Walking Dead and Guardians of the Galaxy, Michael Rooker is 69. From Clueless and Ant-Man, actor Paul Rudd is 55. From Scrubs, Zach Braff turns 49. DJ Tanner in Full House, Candace Cameron Burr is 48. And from The Vampire Diaries and The Flash, Rick Cosnett is 41. From Cobra Kai, Peyton List is 26. And Peyton's uh, twin, Spencer List, is 26 as well. Funny how it works that way. Twins sharing the same birthday. Though some of the people who celebrate the 6th day of April is their birthday. If this is your birthday... Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. And on this Saturday, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox will start off in uh, Laguna Beach, California, uh, with an episode of the Bob Hope Show, 76 years ago, April 6, 1948, with Dinah Shore. That's coming up next. In times of economic uncertainty and chaos, your money means nothing. You may not even be able to get it from your bank or ATM. And the money you do have in the stock market will go down and down. What you can bank on is gold and silver. Gold and silver have been a reliable and trusted form of currency for thousands of years. Gold and silver have never been worth zero, and typically gold holds its value during economic turmoil. Call the gold hotline now and learn how to protect your money and your assets with gold and silver. And learn how to set up a new IRA or roll over your current one into a gold-backed IRA. Protect your money from the next market crash with gold and silver. Call now for your free gold guide. 800-515-6302. 800-515-6302. 800-515-6302. That's 800-515-6302. And now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we go back 76 years to an episode of the Bob Hope Show from April 6, 1948. His guest is Dinah Shore. Tonight from Laguna Beach, California, on behalf of the Laguna Beach Youth Fund, Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsi Show, starring Bob Hope and his special guest, Dinah Shore. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob in Laguna, where the sea meets the sky, and they expect MacArthur to land here first, Hope. (laughs) Telling you that even if you're too young to be affected by the congressional income tax cut, to use Pepsi regularly without any scolding, and your teeth will never be exempted, and your kissing will always be withholding. (laughs) 
Well, here we are at Laguna Beach. This is where the new look originated. During the summer, the men were their t- eyes two inches longer down here. <laughs> Couldn't get my tongue into high <laughs> This is really an exclusive swimming hole any wave, any wave coming in without a white cap Is stopped offshore and sent down to San Diego <laughs> They say Laguna is the Riviera of America Only trouble here is so many people wear slacks You can't tell a niece from a nephew But there was good news from Washington last week for a change. John Q. Public finally got his income tax cut. Income tax cut. That's just a sneaky way of saying, let's give him coffee money, Sam. They may remember in November. <laughs> this sort of thing... This sort of thing happens every election year. They reduce taxes so you can afford to buy Dewey buttons. <laughs> it was a nice gesture, but who needs more money? I've grown to love dandelion greens. And speaking of green stuff, I'm happy that spring is here again With the sun shining, the flowers blooming And the birds and pedestrians flying through the trees <laughs> California climate is so even You couldn't tell when spring was here If you didn't check the pneumonia cases at the hospital <laughs> As usual in California, March came in like a lion Went out wearing galoshes <laughs> And spring is the season for romance I know, today I saw a pilot spelling out Honest John loves Madman Month <laughs> Even the worst of enemies get filled with love this time of year. I looked in the refrigerator this morning and the butter and the oleo margarine were snuggling. <laughs> and it's very romantic in Hollywood. Luella and Hedda both reported that C. Aubrey Smith and Dame May Whitty are holding tea bags. <laughs> and Sinatra was spring cleaning out of his house yesterday, but he made a terrible mistake. He got too near the vacuum cleaner and hasn't been heard from since. <laughs> Of course, spring fever makes everyone so lazy. Just this morning, I saw a squirrel getting nuts for the winter. He was putting pennies into a peanut machine. <laughs> Everything's so tired. On the way down here, I turned on my car radio, and an orchestra was playing, I'm looking under a four-leaf clover. <laughs> I'll work this way for that. <laughs> Maybe Petrillo's in the house. And... and everybody's gardening. Some raise flowers, some raise vegetables. John L. Lewis is raising cane. He planted his eyebrows and up came the miners. <laughs> and, now, and now that it's spring, President Truman put a pot of geranium out on his balcony and he waters it twice a day, waiting for Taft to walk underneath. Ought to be in Paris in the spring Ought to be anywhere these days Before the Russians get there <laughs> But there'll be no spring in Moscow this year Joe caught the groundhog reading Winchell <laughs> Winchell is giving Stalin one last chance If Russia doesn't come to terms before his next option He's going to fly over and drop a 40-ton bottle of Jurgen's lotion on the Kremlin <laughs> Using Miriam, sore sing and smile, had no win and style, so folks don't be like Miriam. Use Miriam. Heston had won by three to one. Just recently, families from coast to coast, thousands of people, were asked to compare new Pepsid and toothpaste with the brands they'd been using at home. By an overwhelming majority, by an average of three to one. They preferred new Pepsodent over any other brand they tried. Yes, with families who made comparison tests. Pepsodent won by three to one. For its cool, minty flavor that lingers on and on. Families who made comparison tests chose Pepsodent three to one. For making the breath so lastingly clean. Families who made comparison tests 
chose Pepsodent, three to one. And for cleaning teeth better, giving bright new sparkle to your smile. Families who made comparison tests chose Pepsodent, three to one. So for new pleasure in brushing your teeth, new pleasure in the results you'll see, try cool, minty, new Pepsodent toothpaste with Irium. The three-to-one favorite with families all over America. Dear Miriam, sweet Miriam, now she's using Irium. So sing and smile, has a grin and style, so folks up be like Miriam. Use Irium. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of singing popularity were votes, I've got the next president here right now. She has a voice so full of magic, she can read the weather report and make a number one on the hit parade. Here she is, America's queen of song, Miss Dinah Shore. Honey, I've been down, down to Memphis town, where the people smile on you all the while. Hospitality, they were good to me. I couldn't spend a dime, I had the grandest time. I went out a-dancing with a Tennessee dear. A fella there named Handy had a band you should hear. While those people swayed, man, they really played real harmony. I never will forget the tune that Handy called the Memphis Blues. They got a fiddler there that always flickens his hair. Oh, Lordy, how he pulls on his bow. And when you hear that tune, listen to the trombone croon. Oh, it sounds just like a sinner on revival day. That melancholy strain, that ever haunting refrain, it really That was Dinah Shore singing Memphis Blues, accompanied by Les Brown and his We're in Laguna at Lee Baring's Beach and Tennis Club Orchestra. <laughs> Dinah, that was swell. You're tops for my money. Money. That reminds me. Please but... don't spoil a beautiful friendship, please. <laughs> anyway, you've got your own show with Harry James, haven't you, Dinah? That's right. And you know, Bob, you remind me quite a bit of Harry. Really? Do you mean we're both handsome, talented, and attractive pretty girls? No, Bob. You've both been made famous by a horn. Not so loud. Petrillo's liable to ask me for dues. Oh, I do declare. <laughs> Honey, you're just the funniest man I ever saw in my life. <laughs> you're, from the, you're from the Sooth, ain't you, Dinah? Well, yes, I am, Bob. How in the world can you tell? That's easy once you get the hang of it. <laughs> but seriously, Dinah, I really love the way you handle a song. Thank you, Bob. You've always had a nice voice. Why is it you don't sing more often? I have an agreement with Crosby. <laughs> There's so much jealousy at Paramount. But uh, now that you mention it, now that you mention it, I thought Crosby and I sang a pretty good duet on the road to Rio. Oh, I saw the picture, Bob, and together you two look more like a trio. <laughs> well, our girdles didn't come back from the laundry in time. <laughs> but you know, I did sing in my first picture. I, I sing the light stuff, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, why don't you sing more like Jolson, sincere and realistic? Well, you know, when he sings April showers, you can almost hear the rain. Rain. That's the water on his knees squishing into action. <laughs> Say, Bob, what's this about you singing in your first picture? Oh, you remember the song. It's about two sleepy people. Oh. Say, Bob, why are they sleepy? Well, I have my regular listeners, you know. <laughs> 
Here we are, out of cigarettes, holding hands and yawning. Look how late it gets. Two sleepy people by dawn's early light, and too much in love to say good night. Mm. Gee, Robert, here we are, newlyweds in our own little apartment. Yeah, ain't it wonderful? Just ten days ago, I carried you across that threshold. Yes. Yeah. Robert, why are you looking so puzzled? Think I should let you down? <laughs> First, tell me, who's oozy, itsy, bitsy, lovems is ooze? I is ooze. <laughs> Beg pardon? I is ooze. <laughs> I like that. Oh, I as ooze. <laughs> oh, well, ooze is my darling. And you, ooze has so much talent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gee, I'll never forget how we met in the park. You were feeding nuts to the squirrels. Yes, and you keep beating the squirrels to the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I looked at you, I forgot where I buried them. <laughs> Robert... Didn't your father ever tell you about the birds and the bees and the flowers? No, nah, he just left me in the woods to learn for myself. <laughs> Here we are in a cozy chair Picking on a wishbone from the Frigidaire Two sleepy people with nothing to say And too much in love to break away <sighs> Are you happy, Cream Puff? Oh, yes, Colonel. <laughs> That's cuddles. <laughs> uh, Curdles. I'm sorry. I must look like an Ador milkman or something. <laughs> you to bring your own writers? <laughs> Gee, honey. <laughs> that ticker. Remember how we got engaged? Oh, yes, I'll never forget it. You switched <laughs> to pond. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to be an old maid. <laughs> and I'll never regret it, darling. Isn't marriage wonderful? Oh, it certainly is, dear. Shall I get your pipe and slippers? No, thanks. This time I think I'll use tobacco. <laughs> Bob, I just love our apartment. Isn't it a cozy place? Sure is. Of course, it'll be better when we get furniture. <laughs> I don't see why you won't let me buy any. Oh, but honey, it's so much more fun going to the quiz shows. <laughs> I hate quiz show that Ralph Edwards and his consequences. Well, you'd have married me anyway, wouldn't you? <laughs> Do you remember the nights we used to linger in the hall? Father didn't like you at all. Do you remember the reason why we married in the fall? To rent this little nest and get a bit of rest. Oh, isn't it heavenly? Oh. Ah, you missed me. Sound like the U.N. moved in upstairs. Oh, no, that's the couple next door. They're celebrating their 10th anniversary. Oh. I've given you the best years of my life, and what have I got to show for it? Wrinkles, you prune face. <laughs> Rob dead. Don't think I haven't tried. <laughs> Just a lover's quarrel. <laughs> Too bad you didn't warn me about your mother. <laughs> oh, Robert, darling, promise me we'll never fight like that. I promise forever and ever now, Jolson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when I think of the men I could have married, it makes me sick. Wait a minute. I'll think of them too and get sick with you. <laughs> 
Herbert, you know, I did your laundry for the first time today, and I'm afraid I didn't do a very good job. Oh, honey, you did a swell job. You shouldn't feel bad because you put starch in my socks and darned up all the buttonholes in my shirt. <laughs> Well, that's good. Yeah, and they look even better if you'd have washed them first. <laughs> what a husband you are! In ten years, you never bought me any clothes. What are you squawking about? You're dressed in silk. Yeah, but I want to change. I'm getting tired of wearing the wedding gown. <laughs> Robert, this is terrible. We've got to go over there and stop him before somebody gets hurt. Well, it's not as liable to be me. <laughs> Come on, darling. Let's hurry. There. Here we are. Quick now. Knock on the door. Gee, it's got awful quiet in there. Oh, hello. Uh, where's your husband? He's not home yet. Please, darling. No, I do love you. I do. I do. Oh! oh. Yeah, but what's that? The radio. I'm listening to Happiness House. <laughs> Two sleepy people by dawn's early light And too much in love to say good night Captain had won by three to one. Yes, in a recent survey, families from coast to coast, thousands of people, compared new Pepsodent and toothpaste with brands they'd been using at home. By an overwhelming average of three to one, they preferred new Pepsodent and toothpaste with Arium over any other brand they tried. The Harry Whiteside family of Sepulpa, Oklahoma, preferred new Pepsodent on every single count. Mrs. Whiteside says... Indeed, we do like Pepsodent. In fact, we think Pepsodent is the best toothpaste we ever tried. It's so wonderful for cleaning breath. And even my young son, Carl, notices how much brighter it makes his teeth. We all think Pepsodent's flavor is tops, too. And family after family agree with the white sides. Yes, with families who made comparison tests, Pepsodent won by three to one. Get it without delay. <laughs> Well, Dinah, how do you like Laguna Beach? Isn't it a quaint little seacoast town? And by the way, Bob, thank you very much for showing me around. Oh, don't men mention it, Dinah. How about another shore dinner tonight? Oh, thanks, Bob. But this time I'd rather have one in a restaurant. <laughs> well, don't be silly. The clams are fresher when you dig them yourself. <laughs> don't you think? They... Hey, Bob, you know Laguna Beach is a famous artist retreat. It looks more like a complete <laughs> surrender. Gosh, I love the atmosphere here. The stores are so old-fashioned, and they have such wonderful antiques. I know what you mean. I ordered a lamb chop at ye old Victor Hugo tea shoppy, and it came out wearing green velvet pantaloons. <laughs> Yes, but it's a great town, and I like the natives here, Donna. You know, they're such unusual types. Uh, you ought to hear what they say about you. That's <laughs> <laughs> very vague. Look at that orchid. <laughs> Miss Vague, what are you doing here in Laguna? Uh, well, I'm with a stock company. Well, serves them right. They should have locked the corral. <laughs> I hope you're so clever. <laughs> Tell me, did you drive down to the beach or were you washed up with the rest of the grunion? <laughs> oh, dear. I'm having so much fun down here. I love to go surfboarding, Mr. Hope. You surfboarding? Yes. Say, that's dangerous, isn't it? Tough to stay on, Miss Vane? Oh, no, not for me. The last time I tried it, I stayed on the surfboard for hours. For hours? Yes, and then when I wasn't looking, some sneak pulled it into the water. <laughs> oh, well, 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 there's Dinah Shore. Oh, tell me, do you two know each other, Miss Vane? Oh, of course. 
because she married one of my best dreams. <laughs> well, well, Miss Vague and I are old friends, Bob. We have adjoining ranches in the valley. Uh, yes, we do. Oh, I really love ranching, Dinah. It's so romantic. I know. But don't you think you're going a little too far, Miss Vague, branding all your cattle with your phone number? <laughs> better way to meet a nice cowboy. <laughs> oh, say, that reminds me. Mr. Hope, did I tell you that my boyfriend, Waldo, lives here in Laguna? Your boyfriend, Waldo? Well, yes. what's his last name, Miss Vague? Uh, well, he hasn't any. His mother wanted a dog. <laughs> no, I... I... I'm, on, I'm only joking, really. His name is Waldo, and oh, he's happy every time he's with me. How do you know, Miss Vague? Well, I can smell it on his breath. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, as I, I, I started to say, I, I was going to say, Waldo, you know, is a very talented painter. He's a painter, and he likes the bottle, huh? I know, Mr. Hope, he doesn't like the bottle. He doesn't? No, now he buys it in the keg. <laughs> oh, shame on me. <laughs> well, he must paint with three feathers instead of a brush. <laughs> I'll take a quart. Where are you? Let me see. I, I want to speak to Dinah. I yes, want to tell you that I heard you tonight on the way down here, and I love your singing. Oh, you're sweet. You know, last year, I was with the traveling opera company. Oh, what fun I had appearing in Rossini's great opera. William Tell? No, but Frank blabbed a little. <laughs> Well, look, if you like to sing, come along with us, Miss Vague. Dinah and I are going over to the Laguna Light Opera Company now and audition for parts. Oh, I'd love to. Let's go. The Laguna Light Opera Company. Here's the opera house. Oh, look. Mr. Hope. My goodness, there's someone auditioning before the impresario now. Big it off, big it off, big it off, big it off, big Next. Figaro! 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 Impresario, why do you keep shooting all the singers? Can't help it, I'm allergic to figs. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Colonna, you're the impresario? Yes, Miss Vague, and on behalf of the entire staff, I welcome you to the Laguna Beach Dark Opera Company. Uh, Professor, don't you mean the Laguna Beach... Light Opera Company? No, forgot to pay the electric bill. <laughs> oh, now pardon me while I continue the rehearsal. Once more, gentlemen. <laughs> hey, uh... Oh, pa pardon me, Hope, while I check the score. We're playing Rigoletto. Anything wrong? Plenty. We're losing. <laughs> Look, I have a couple of singers with me, Professor Colon. Let's see if you can guess who they are. La, la. Why, oh, that's Dinah Shaw. Couldn't be anyone but Shaw. And now another voice. La, 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 la. Who's that, Professor? The same Shaw, but at low tide. <laughs> I want to audition for your opera company, too, Clone. I'll give you a sample of my singing. <laughs> what do you think? That was Il Trovatore. You should have waited till he got better. <laughs> hey, Professor, I didn't know you were conducting the Laguna Light Opera Company. Why, this is my life. I love opera. It's in my blood. Why, when I close my eyes... I hear the habanera from Carmen, the triumphal march from Aida, the jeweled song from Faust. What do you hear from Madam Butterfly? Nothing, and I'm getting worried. <laughs> well, tell me, Professor, as a great opera impresario in the works of Wagner, which do you think is more distinctive? The weaving of light motifs into the orchestral fabric, that is, the use of a few notes to characterize personages and dramatic events, or the free use of bass clarinets and English horns together with chromatic harmonies and progressions employed at unorthodox intervals? Pardon? <laughs> I said, in the works of Wagner... Too late, the season is over. <laughs> oh, Professor, we're already 
me to sing now. Can't we do an opera now? Oh, very well. We'll do the Laguna version of that famous opera, William Tell. Okay, Professor, start the music. I am William Tell, you know. We know. And I am his son, the Schmo. The Schmo. And I'm his girl, Esma. Esma. I stand by with the plasma. Plasma. And it is mother I'm here to see. He'll get holes in his head. Oh, I wish I were dead. Please don't shoot. Ah, shut up. Don't shoot, my son. Shut up. My bone. My head. Shut up. <laughs> my knees, they shake. But I'm game right to the core But if you die It won't be such a loss oh, Then we'll all have Apple sauce <laughs> And our hush falls over the audience As William Tell Colonna Walks to one side of the stage And his son to the other They put an apple on his son Bob's head William Tell draws back his bow And... I will now put the arrow through the apple. Uh, oh. But, Professor, you shot Mr. Hope in the head. I'm sorry, that stem on the front fooled me. <laughs> oh, thanks, poor old Dick Davis. That's all, huh? We're a little late. I want to thank Donna Shore for the use of her wonderful voice. And thanks to you people of Laguna Beach for turning out on behalf of your local youth center. It's people like you who are holding down the biggest job in America, the job of turning out good citizens. All over the USA today, good citizens turned out to celebrate Army Day. And I suppose you've noticed that Army Day comes during Boys Club Week. I can't say if there's an official reason for that, but I will say this. If you have a son in the Boys Club, consider yourself lucky. And if you have a son in the Army, be proud, because, mister, you have a son who belongs to the finest club in America. And that's all for tonight, except a last-minute word to the Army. Tension. Next Tuesday night's guest, Lana Turner. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Next week, Lever Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent, will bring you the Bob Hope Show with Bob's special guest, Lana Turner. Lana Shore appeared tonight with the courtesy of the Philip Morris Show. Call for music. This is Libby Collins, your Hollywood reporter with good news. The new tiny diamonds of Lux are here. These diamonds were discovered during the war, but new machinery was needed to make them. Now they're ready. These tiny, sheer, delicate diamonds burst into suds in a jiffy. They're faster. Make thick, abundant, long-lasting suds. They're richer. And they keep pretty under things lovely three times as long, tests prove. So avoid harsh washing methods. Get your new Lux diamonds tomorrow. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. From 76 years ago, April 6, 1948, the Bob Hope Show. Coming up next as a special request, Monty Woolley and the Magnificent Montague. Are you suffering with anxiety, depression, PTSD, an eating disorder, or even a substance abuse problem? If it's causing problems at work or with your family, get help now. At Insight Mental Health and Wellness, we help and treat all types of depression and mental issues. We will help you use your insurance to get away from it all, to a beautiful sunny and tranquil vacation-like environment, so you can recharge yourself. And with the Family Medical Leave Act you could take the time off you need from work. Plus with the Affordable Care Act your treatment could be 100% covered. If you're suffering from any kind of anxiety, depression, PTSD, eating disorder, or even a substance abuse problem, use your insurance and get away from it all. Come to sunny California. Call Insight Mental Health and Wellness now. 800-281-8944. 800-281-8944. 800-281-8944. That's 800-281-8944. Griffin J. over on Facebook, who uh, remembered the uh, March 5, 1994 Salt Lake City Library hostage situation, asked me if I would include some episodes of the Magnificent Montague. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, we try to find shows that we can. Here's an episode starring Monty Woolley 
and as the Magnificent Montague, going back 73 years, the one-season show, April 6, 1951. Magnificent Montague, starring Monty Woolley. Yes, it's the Magnificent Montague, the Saturday night transcribed feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by Anison for fast relief of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, And first in television. And now, the magnificent Montague. When Edwin the Magnificent Montague left the Shakespearean theater for the less artistic but more profitable role of Uncle Goodhart, star of an afternoon radio program, his one link with his beloved theater remained the Proscenium Club, that stalwart actors' club dedicated to two great ideals... The return of the Shakespearean drama and trying to pay off the mortgage on its clubhouse. Edwin is at a cultural meeting of the club right now. His wife, Lily, and Agnes, the maid, are expecting him for lunch. In the meantime, they are indulging in a little culture of their own, a gin rummy game. Agnes is happy. She is winning. There's a tumble-down shack and a rusty old mill. But it's my home, sweet home, up on Mockingbird Hill. Agnes, please. Uh, What is it, honey? Well, I'm trying to play cards. When you sing, I keep throwing you wrong cards. You do? (laughs) Tra-la-la. Oh, Agnes, let me concentrate. I haven't won a game all morning from you. Snap it up, will you, honey? The magnificent monster will be home any minute. Mm, What shall I discard? Jack? Well, ace? No. Six of clubs. I don't think you can use that. Nah. There. The six of clubs. (laughs) Jen. Oh, no. I'm stuck with 36 points. What's the score now? I'm ahead 246,300 points. (laughs) Oh, Agnes, what does that come to in money? 14 cents. Get it up. (laughs) That's enough for today, Agnes. Let's set the table for lunch. You know how Edwin likes to see everything on the table. I'd like to see something on the table right now. What? My 14 cents. <laughs> oh, now, Eric. Get it up. Later, Eric. <laughs> I had some loose change on my dress, sir. You better get it before your husband sees it. The boy. <laughs> the boy with the magnetized fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Edward is just trying to raise every cent he can for the proscenium club. The mortgage on the clubhouse is due again. Thanks for telling me. I got a dollar in my room I better nail to the floor. <laughs> every year it's another drive. It's amazing the clever ideas he comes up with every year to raise money. Yeah, I wonder what the big scheme is this year. Guess the exact number of hairs in his beard and win a box of Blue Jay corn plasters. (laughs) Agnes, he's desperate about this fundraising. He doesn't want to overlook any source of money. Aren't you overlooking something? What? My 14 cents. Get it up. (laughs) Well, here's your 14 cents. Come on, one more hand. I'll deal. Oh, that's Edwin at the door. Let's be quiet. Maybe he'll go away. Deal, Agnes. I'll get the door. Hello, Edwin. Lily, are you answering the door? Yes. My fondest dreams have come true. Agnes has been drafted. (laughs) No, Edwin. Agnes is dealing a rummy hand. Come on, honey. Grab your cards. This is a charming scene. The house is a mess. Lunch isn't ready, and our maid is dealing. (laughs) Oh, it's you. Who were you expecting? Nick the Greek? Yeah, sit down, pigeon. <laughs> Thank you. I have better things to do with my time. What's that on the table? Huh? Oh, 14 cents. You touch that and I'll break your arm. <laughs> Edwin, that's Agnes's money. Just make one move for that money, Greasy Thumb. Just one move. Agnes, it's for a worthy cause. I got a worthier cause. <laughs> This 14 cents is going right into the Let's Buy Agnes a Squirrel Coat Before Christmas Fund. Agnes, the Proscenium Club is on its last leg. I just want to keep mine from freezing this one. Edwin, it's getting ridiculous. Every year the members of the club have to go through these frantic last-minute appeals. Raffles, rummage sales, bazaars. Lily, we have to meet the mortgage. 
That mortgage has been met more times than General MacArthur. <laughs> Edward, every year this struggle to keep the proscenium clubhouse going. Why don't you close it down? Close the proscenium club? The last stronghold of Shakespeare in this country? Never. It is not just a club for a few old Shakespearean actors. It is the fortress for the old soldiers carrying the flickering torch of culture, making a last desperate stand against the forces of Milton Berle. <laughs> <laughs> it's another Alamo. Uh, don't get excited. Picture the clubhouse, Lily. It should be a shrine. I've seen it. It should be condemned. <laughs> uh, charming Agnes, you seem to be able to put things so well. See if you can guess where I'm about to put my foot. Edwin! <laughs> The Presidium Club is desperate. Sir Guy Teasdale, our club treasurer, is coming up here with the, with the club's financial statement. Sir Guy's coming up here? Yes, the executive committee wants Sir Guy and myself to put our heads together. Uh, do you think you can raise the money? Well, knock on wood. That's just what it'll sound like when you and Sir Guy put your heads together. <laughs> uh, Lily, it just came to me. Ah, uh, there's Sir Guy. Let him in. Give me a chance to lock the icebox first. No, Agnes. That vulture. He compliments you and you stuff him with food. Get the door. It's Sir Guy. Montague, Montague. Sir Guy. Come in, Sir Guy. Me, God, Lily. You look as young and captivating as the day we all turned together in Hamlet. Oh, oh no. Uh, Agnes, fix some tea for Sir Guy. Okay, I'll go take a look at the tea bag and see if it's good for one more dunk. <laughs> All right, I guess. Edward, leave her alone. Uh, sit down, Sir Guy. Thank you. I just can't get over how beautiful you look, Lily. Uh, uh, <laughs> Agnes, fix some sandwiches for Sir Guy. Mm, I tell you, it's amazing, Lily. You look like a girl of 18. Oh, Agnes, bring out a few cookies, too. Okay, Sir Guy. Well, you now have tea, sandwiches, and cookies. Would you like to try for steak? Agnes. <laughs> You and Sir Guy go about your business. Have you all the reports, Guy? Uh, here are the books. Let me put on my glasses. Good. Now, what's the situation? Here we are. Annual financial statement of the Proscenium Club for the fiscal year. Whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Here we are. Yearly income from dues. $26. Only $26? I paid 20 of it myself. Bully for you. Oh. Oh, God, uh, what, uh, what other income? Annual Christmas dance to augment the $26 in the treasury. You remember the dance? <laughs> Jolly affair, wasn't it? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. What a turn out. <laughs> How did we do? We lost the $26. <laughs> Go on. Uh, March 5th. The annual Shakespeare Memorial Beefsteak Banquet to defray the losses sustained by the Christmas dance. Well, you couldn't lose on that. There was no expense. The meat was donated, and it was cooked by the ladies' auxiliary. Oh, we did well there, Montague. March the 5th. Profit, $37. Good. Well, what's next? March the 6th. Hospital and stomach pump expenses. <laughs> For members who attended the Shakespeare Memorial Beefsteak Banquet. A hundred and sixteen dollars and thirty-eight cents. Sir Guy, we actors in the Presidium Club must face reality once in our lives. We haven't a cent in the treasury, and a thousand dollar payment on the mortgage is due. Oh, the mortgage. Well, thanks for our emergency committee to save the clubhouse. That's been taken care of. The whole thousand? Maybe more. God, the emergency committee came through with an idea at last. Well, what is it? Here's yours. My what? Your punch board. <laughs> My punch board? Oh, no. Last year it was pyramid clubs. <laughs> Montague, this is so simple. There are a hundred punches on the board. At ten cents a punch, you make ten dollars. But wait, look what it says on the top of the board. Punch for profit. You may win ten dollars. Sir Guy, I suppose someone punches out the $10 hole. Montague, you're so naive. It says you may win $10. Sir Guy, you, you mean there is no $10 punch on the whole board? That's the very same question I asked the man who sold the punch boards to us. Well, what did he say? He just winked. <laughs> it's a 
Montague, stop it. Say you can win ten dollars when there isn't a chance of winning. Montague, you can't stoop low enough these days. You read the Kafauver report? Why, in our own city, there's a gambling king, Big Ed McClune, who takes the public for a million dollars a year. Montague, the public wants you to fleece them. They get mad if you don't. Well, you're right, Cigar. If the public can pour a million dollars in a year into the pocket of, the, of Big Ed McClune and let the Proscenium Club fall by the wayside, now give me that punch board. Yeah, here. Goodbye, Cigar. Goodbye, Montague. In the words of the immortal Shakespeare, cheap punching. <laughs> The magnificent Montague with a punch board. No, no, I can't. I'm not made that way. I couldn't sell anyone a punch on a crooked punch board. Who could I possibly do that to? Is the guy gone? Oh, Agnes. <laughs> Keep your distance. The last time you said, oh, Agnes, like that, it cost me my day off. Agnes, I have a little gadget here that may get you your squirrel coat. What is it, a trap? No, it's a... <laughs> it's a punch board. Edwin, you'll be late to your Uncle Goodhart broadcast. Now, stop being charged. Delay it for the club. Agnes, it's only a dime a punch. You may win ten dollars. Agnes, it's for the proscenium club. Come on, Agnes, only ten cents a punch. You can win ten dollars. Now, stop ganging up on me, will you? What am I working for, a family or a syndicate? <laughs> Agnes, if we lose the proscenium club... Here's a dime. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. Uh, punch out a hole. This is a big waste of time, you know, but here goes. My mother told me to pick this one. There. Now unfold the little piece of paper that was pushed out. Okay, here goes nothing. Agnes, even if you don't win, they always have cute sayings printed on the back of the slips. Well, here's a cute saying. Uh, well, what does it say? Ten dollars. I... <laughs> Agnes won the $10. Get it up. Agnes, is a mistake. Let me explain. Honey talks, get it up. It's impossible. The man wins. Cross my hand with a beautiful, dirty green saw box. Agnes, I'll at least punch out the rest. I'll punch you in the nose. Come on, boy. Ten clams, two fives, ten ones. I'll take it in loose change. Agnes, the club is fighting for his life. I'm fighting for a squirrel coat. Get it up. <laughs> ten bucks. Tippy, tippy, ten. <sighs> Edwin Agnes won, now give her the money. But Lily, the club hasn't got a cent. Then pay her out of your own pocket. You gambled and lost. But, uh, oh, all right. Here, Agnes, ten dollar bill. Ah, oh, my favorite picture, Alexander Hamilton. I haven't seen you in years. <laughs> Edwin, I'll take a punch. It's no use, Lily. Lily, let's face it. We need a thousand dollars and we're running around with ten cent punch boards. <laughs> Public doesn't care about the Presidium Club and... All it stands for. Oh, now, Edwin, the public has so many other worthwhile causes to contribute to. Mm, sure, they have to contribute a million dollars a year to Big Ed McClune's gambling joints. Maybe if we got rid of Big Ed, there'd be a little money left for causes like the Presidium Club. Edwin, stop getting excited. There's nothing you can do about it. There isn't, eh? <laughs> Lily, I'm going to drive Big Ed McClune and his gang out of town. Edwin, how can you drive anybody out of town? McClune is a power in this city. You're all alone. No, I'm not. I have a microphone. Remember, I'm Uncle Goodhart. I am a power, too. Edwin, for good... Don't try and stop me, Lily. In the words of Macbeth, I will not yield to kiss the ground beneath big McClune's feet. Before my body, I throw my warlike shield. Lay on, McClune, and damn be him who first cries, hold enough. We'll be back with the magnificent Montague in just a moment. Here is something you should know if you ever suffer from the sudden pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. It is a way to ease the pain, often within a few minutes. A way that is incredibly fast and effective. It's Anison. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people were first introduced to Anison through their own physicians or dentists. But today, these tablets are in such widespread use that all drug counters have them, and anyone may enjoy their benefits. Next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, by all means, try Anison. You'll like the convenience of Anison tablets, and you'll be delighted with Anison's incredibly fast action. A N A C I N. Anison. Ask for Anison by name today at your druggist. And 
now back to the magnificent Montague. He is just finishing his Uncle Goodhart broadcast. Listen. And so, Ronald, here you are again, visiting Uncle Goodhart in his little cottage on the sunny side of the lane, with the police hot on your trail. <laughs> now you want Uncle Goodhart to hide a car in his garage. Ronald, where is your memory? You have seven of them in there already. <laughs> I understand, Ronald, everybody likes an automobile. But you, Ronald, you like everybody's automobile. <laughs> Ronald, I looked the other way when you filed the serial numbers off those seven cards and made out those false registration papers. But now, Ronald, you ask too much of old Uncle Goodhart. You want me to make a decision for you. Should you join the auto club? <laughs> this is a question you must ask your own heart, Ronald. But no matter what you decide, Ronald... Remember, as you ride out on the highway with the sound of sirens behind you, always keep your head high into the sun and lie. <laughs> And so ends another episode of Uncle Goodhart. Until he meets you again in his little cottage on the sunny side of the lane, here is Uncle Goodhart with his thought for today. Uh, dear housewives, I was going to read a spring poem to you sent in by Mrs. Ophelia Zetz of Mineola, Long Island. It's called Fertilizer, the workhorse of the god. <laughs> But, housewives, as you know, before we can plant our little gardens, we must get rid of the weeds. There is a weed in our city by the name of Big Ed McClune. Mr. Montague! We must weed out Big Ed McClune. He and his gambling empire must be pulled out by the roots. Mr. Montague, please! Quiet. Down with Big Ed McClune. The opinions expressed by Uncle Goodhart are entirely his own and do not reflect the attitude toward Mr. McClune of anybody around here. Honest. Let me at that microphone. Uh, down with McClune. Music, music. We're off the air. Announcer, how dare you cut it? Uh, where's Springer? Springer? The producer. Oh, there you are, Springer. Mr. Montague, have you gone nuts? Now wait, Springer. Saying things like that about Big Ed McLoon on the air. What is that? I don't know I'm committing su suicide. Now, Springer, stop carrying on. I'll carry on. You'll be carried out. Oh, why did you have to... Ah, oh, here's our director, Mr. Zinzer. Well, Zinzer, what did you think of the broadcast? Oh, it was a little... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Zinzer. Thank you. <laughs> well... Buenas noches, Mr. Montague. Buenas noches? Well, Zinza, you're not in Mexico. I will be in a few hours. <laughs> Zinza, you've got to stay here and face it. Shame on you, Zinza. Hadn't you any spunk? Spunk, schmunk. I'm getting out while the getting's good. <laughs> Zinza, come back! Well, that's the kind of man you are, Mr. Zinza. You turn and run. The minute it looks as if there's going to be a fight. Mr. Montague, I built my whole career around being a coward. <laughs> this isn't getting us anywhere. I'd better phone the sponsor. I just did. Huh? What'd he say? Buenas noches. <laughs> no, that's the way it is. You're going to leave me holding the bag. You're not going to be left holding the bag, Mr. Montague. You're going to be in it. <laughs> What's the matter with you two? Haven't you any good red American blood in you? Sure we have. We just don't like it to get splashed around. <laughs> Mr. Montague, come into my office. You'll have to write a retraction. A retraction? Never. Springer, if you think I will take back what I said about that monster. Oh, my phone. Hello? What? Uh, right away. Come on, Zinza. What is it? They want us in the executive office. Goodbye, radio. Here's where I go back to selling hot chestnuts. <laughs> Here's a pen and paper. Write that retraction. Never. Come, Zinza. Retraction. Retraction. I'll write something McLoon will remember. I'll have no trouble from him after he reads this. And there. There. Dear Mr. McLoon. Oh, don't shoot. Don't shoot. <laughs> Montague, there's a panic down at the telephone switchboard. It's lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, what's happening? 
What's happening? Listeners all over the city are on the mark. Well, don't let them get me. Get you? They want to get McClune. The Brooklyn chapter of the Uncle Goodhart fan club has just torn down the front of McClune's Athey Doocy Club. <laughs> Gentler than you mean. Your Uncle Goodheart listeners are behind you. In the Bronx, 5,000 women have pledged themselves to give up Canasta until they get McLoone. <laughs> You've got him on the run. I have? His honor, the mayor called. He's putting the entire police force at your disposal. Every crime committee in the country wants you to be on it. They do. The sponsor wants you to know his flugel soap is behind you. He is. He's printing Break McLoone on every wrapper. Uh, he is. With every ten wrappers you send in, you get a Break McLoone hatchet. Mr. Montague, you've got everybody behind you. Yeah, and to think we were afraid. <laughs> if I see that McLoone now, I'll spit right in his eye. <laughs> You see, gentlemen, what one fearless citizen can do. Never for a moment did I hesitate. You're my new hero, Mr. Montague. On with the fight. I will not rest until every gambling joint owned by McClune is closed. Our battle cry, boys. Get McClune! Hello, this is the Get McClune headquarters, Sergeant Agnes speaking. You want Uncle Goodhart to speak at your rally tonight? Sorry, there are six rallies ahead of you for tonight. Agnes, did you get Edwin's full dress suit out for the banquet the governor is giving in his honor? Yeah, wait till you see it. It looks like he just gave a banquet for them all. <laughs> Hello? What? Oh, the New Rochelle chapter reporting. Okay, give me the figures. You smashed 16 slot machines, two roulette wheels, and sang two floating craft games. Good work. Carry on. Oh, Agnes, just think. In one week, Edwin has closed up every gambling house owned by Big Ed McClune. Now, if he'd only close his mouth. Oh, there's Edwin. I'll get it. Hello, Lily. Here's J. Edgar Montague now. What you hear from the mob? All right, Agnes. Down, girl, down. Well, Lily, it's all over. McClune is through. Oh, Edwin, I'm so proud of you. And to think this all started because I got mad when the Presidium Club couldn't raise the thousand dollars. Oh, a Sir Guy called. The mortgage is due tomorrow. Oh, no. Did they raise any money? Not a cent. Your Uncle Goodhart anti-crime campaign knocked out their punch boards. It was a hopeless struggle keeping the club going. Well, there's someone at the door. Oh, no. Agnes, if it's another citizen's committee asking me to lead another raid... Uh, tell him McClune is through. Okay. Yeah? What is it, mister? Uncle Goodhart live here? Well, yes. One sir. side, lady. No, see Shut you. up. All right, you dames, into the next room. The boss wants to talk the whiskers along. Edwin. Uh, do what the gentleman with the gun says, Lily. In the next room. If you think... Shut I'm... up. Okay, boss, he's all alone. Okay, Knuckles. Outside. I'll handle him alone. I'll be in the hall if you need me, Big Ed. Uh, big, big Ed McClune? Yeah. Took me a long time to find you. Now, my dear Mr. McClune, let's not jump at conclusions. I've been very anxious to meet you. I've been listening to your program a long time. Oh, now, Mr. McClune, I might have exaggerated a little about you. No, you didn't. I didn't? No. <laughs> Awful good art. I'm so ashamed of myself. Oh, shame. I'm a beast and a scoundrel. No, no, Big Ed. You were the only program I ever listened to. I didn't care what a cop or a kafaba committee said about me. But when my own dear Uncle Goodheart blasted me... <laughs> I couldn't look at myself anymore. I'm a bum. Oh. <laughs> now, pull yourself together, Big Ed. I've been crying myself to sleep every night for a week. I want to be a decent citizen, like you say in your program. I want to hold up my head up high into the sun and life. <laughs> oh, Big Ed, you have paid the penalty of crime. Your gambling joints are gone, but you have found yourself. I tell you, I'm true living the way I did. In a tidy room penthouse on Park Avenue like a hunted animal. <laughs> I have money. I want to do some good. Well, Big Ed, uh, uh, you say you have money? I'm loaded. <laughs> uh, Big 
Sigurd, there just happens to be a fine cause that needs money. Uh, how would you like to be a philanthropist? None of that stuff, Uncle. I told you I was going straight. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Big Ed, Big Ed, this is your chance to redeem yourself. Your chance to help keep Shakespeare alive in our country. Which mob is after him? <laughs> oh, no, no, Big Ed. He can hide out in my place. My torpedoes will never leave his side. Knuckles, Mike! Uh, now, wait, wait. Look, Big Ed, I'm talking about the Presidium Club. My club. But unless they get a thousand dollars by tomorrow, it will have to close its doors forever. Oh, no. No, 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 Yes, those wonderful old actors will have no place to go. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old actors. I'll give them a grand. Big Ed, you pay off the mortgage. Just say it's an anonymous. From Big Ed McClune. The poor old hams will never have to worry about money again. Big Ed McClune, in the words of Shakespeare, you are the noblest Roman of them all. No, I'm a Greek. <laughs> Whatever you are, you have saved the Proscenium Club. Hurry up with this dress shirt. Edwin's due at the bank. Oh, we have time. The mayor is picking me up with a police escort. Oh, you should be proud of yourself, Edwin. Lily, I'm most proud of what I've done for Big Ed McClure. Yes. And isn't it wonderful what he's doing for the proscenium club? Sir Guy told me they've made him an honorary member. Well, I've given him a new and wonderful life, Lily. Edwin, that's the mayor's car. Get so early. And there's Edwin's coat. Here, I'll get the door. Well, hurry up. Mr. Montague, Mr. Montague. Police Commissioner Grady, I'm ready for the banquet. Banquet? We've got a big surprise for you first. You're leading the raid. What raid? Big Ed McClune is operating again. There must be a mistake. He's wide open. He got every roulette wheel, dice table, slot machine in the city installed in a new joint. Oh, no, a new joint. Yeah, he calls it the Proscenium Club. Aye! <laughs> Hurry up, every squad car is waiting for you to lead the raid. Here, here's your hatchet. You go ahead, I'll, I'll meet you there. Okay, you know where it is. Uh, do I know where it is? Yes, yes. Go on. Edwin. Quiet. Where is my suitcase? Where's my coat? Well, Edwin, where are you going? Buenas noches, buenas noches. Here's a word from RCA Victor. That word is Fairfield. And RCA Victor's superb new Fairfield is the last word in console television. It's better looking in every way. Better looking television. RCA Victor television that has been quality proven in over 2 million homes. It's 17 inch television with clear, bright pictures. Steady pictures that are locked in place by RCA Victor's exclusive eyewitness picture synchronizer. Better looking cabinet, too. For in the Fairfield, RCA Victor stylists have captured all the charm and dignity of the classic design. Every line, every detail of this fine furniture piece exhibits the craftsmanship for which RCA Victor is famous. And its beautifully figured doors can play such an important part when the set is not in use. Yes, the Fairfield is better looking in every way. So next chance you get, stop into your RCA Victor dealers. See and hear the exciting new Fairfield. You, too, will discover that RCA Victor Fairfield is better looking in every way. <laughs> Listen again next week, friends, to The Magnificent Montague, starring Marty Woolley. The Saturday night transcribed feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by Anison for fast relief of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The Magnificent Montague is written by Matt Hyken and Billy Friedberg. Anne Seymour as Lily, Pert Kelton as Agnes. Also heard tonight were Art Carney, Johnny Gibson, and John Griggs. Jack Ward at the organ. This is Don Pardo speaking. There you have it by request. 
from 73 years ago, April 6, 1951, Monty Woolley as the Magnificent Montague. On Sunday's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we'll have more comedy with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, Abbott and Costello, Fibber McGee and Molly, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, and Superman. But coming up next, Jack Benny. President Biden recently released a massive $6 trillion budget, the largest budget in U.S. history. And guess who pays the bill? That's right, you, the American taxpayer. American citizens and business owners will be paying more taxes. That's a fact. And if you owe back taxes, they will be coming after you to collect payments. In fact, President Biden also hired thousands more IRS agents to go after you. If you got a letter from the IRS and you know you owe back taxes or you haven't filed in years, don't put your head in the sand. Call us today. We've saved our customers millions of tax dollars. One quick, free phone call will show you how we can reduce your past tax bill and save you thousands. Guaranteed, or you pay nothing. Call now. 800-932-1431. 800-932-1431. That's 800-932-1431. Paid for by the Tax Helpline. Speaking of taxes, I didn't play the the tax version of the Jack Benny show. We'll we'll, we'll get to that one of these days. Uh, Jack Benny next on Classic Radio Theater on this Saturday, 72 years ago, April 6th, 1952. Lucky Strike presents the Jack Benny Program. But first, here's an important message from the National Tobacco Tax Research Council. Ever stop to think that you cigarette smokers help deliver the United States mail? Fact. The post office has an annual deficit of about $600 million. But you cigarette smokers contribute over three times that deficit in cigarette taxes. Yes, out of every cigarette pack you buy, the federal government takes eight cents a pack. And most state and local governments take three or four cents more. That's better than a 50% tax on every cigarette you smoke. Yes, when you buy cigarettes, over half your packs go for tax. And now the Jack Benny program, presented by Lucky Strike. Do you do da do da do da do you do da do da? Be happy, go lucky. Be happy, get better taste. Be happy, go lucky. Get better taste today. Friends, tear and compare. See for yourself that Luckies are made better to taste better. From a newly opened pack, take a cigarette made by any other manufacturer. Carefully tear a thin strip of paper straight down the seam from end to end and gently remove the tobacco. In tearing, be sure not to loosen or dig into the tobacco. Now, do exactly the same with a Lucky Strike. Then compare. Some cigarettes are too loosely packed. Some even fall apart. But look at that Lucky. See how it stays together, a perfect cylinder of fine, mild tobacco. Now, what does this mean to you as a smoker? It means exactly this. Because your Lucky is so round and firm and fully packed, you avoid annoying loose ends that spoil the taste, hot spots that burn harsh and dry. Because your Lucky has long strands of fresh, clean, good-tasting tobacco, it burns evenly, smokes smooth and mild. Yes, tear and compare. Prove to yourself that Luckies are made better to taste better. Then make your next carton Lucky Strike. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, the warm weather is here, so let's go out to Jack Benny's house where we find Jack and Rochester cleaning out the swimming pool. Well, all the water's out of the pool now, boys. Good. Gosh, this pool sure can get dirty in a few months. Maybe it would keep cleaner if it had a tile bottom. Well, I... Or even a cement bottom. <laughs> well, In fact, uh... any kind of a bottom would be better than just plain mud. <laughs> well, I... I would cement it, but I'm growing rice in the shallow end. (laughs) Now, Rochester, when we finish cleaning the pool, I want to transplant some tulips in front of the house. Tulips? Why? 
Well, Queen Juliana of the Netherlands is going to be in town soon. She'll be staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel, which is just a couple of blocks from here, and she may drop in, you know. Oh, then you met Queen Juliana when you were in Holland. Well, no, Rochester. You see, the day before I arrived in Amsterdam, the Queen had gone to Rotterdam, you see. But her husband, Prince Bernhard, he's a, he's a wonderful fellow. Oh, then you met Prince Bernhard. Well, no. You see, I went from Amsterdam to Rotterdam. But when I got to Rotterdam, I found out that they had gone back to Amsterdam. You'd have done better if you'd have gone to Boulderdam. <laughs> I guess so. Now, come on, let's start cleaning the pool. Rochester, go over to the other end, and we'll... Oh, look at that frog over there in the corner. Isn't he cute? Yeah, he's sure big, too. Rochester, help me catch him. Oh, he'd make a cute pet. I'd like to keep him. <laughs> Anything that's green, you like to save. <laughs> Hurry, he's hopping away. Rochester, where'd he go? Where is he? He jumped up on your head, boss. On my head? Well, get him off. Get him off, quick. Hold still, I'll get him. Hello, Jack. What's all the excitement? Rochester, get him off. Boss, boss, Miss Livingston's here. Tip your frog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello, Mary. <laughs> oh, darn it. He got away. And I wanted to keep him. Oh, Jack, you've already got a turtle, a lizard, a garter snake, two crickets, and a caterpillar. What do you want all those things for? Well, Mary, it's no fun coming home at night to an empty house, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of the first time we met. Huh? When you leaned over and whispered in my ear, come up to my apartment, honey, and I'll show you my insects. <laughs> I was a sly one, wasn't I? <laughs> Say, Mary, how do you like the way I'm fixing up my backyard? Oh, it looks fine. And you know, as soon as the pool is filled, I want you to come over and swim every day. Oh, I'd like to, Jack, but I'm putting all my money into savings bonds. Now, wait a minute, Mary. I only charge for the upkeep. Upkeep? You charge 10 cents for the locker, 15 cents for a bathing suit, and a quarter for the use of the pool. Well, I don't charge anything for the shower. No, but the price of towels is ridiculous. <laughs> Rochester. No, well, Rochester's right. You charge for everything. Five cents for a sun chair, seven cents for a beach umbrella, Ten cents for water wings. Mary. You even got a meter on the diving board. <laughs> Look, Mary. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You've got the only swimming pool that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> stock Exchange, Stock Exchange. Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Mary. Hello, Dennis. Oh, hi, kid. Oh, boy, cleaning out your swimming pool. Are you going to fill it, Mr. Benny? Well, I really wasn't planning to for another week or so. Gee, I wish you'd fill it now. Well... Go ahead, Jack. Fill it up. Okay. Rochester, turn the water on. Oh, boy. Hot diggity. How long will it take? About a half hour. Now, Dennis, here's the key to the locker. Go in and put on some trunks. Oh, I'm not going swimming. Then why do you want me to fill the pool? I'm thirsty. <laughs> Look, kid, I'm not filling the pool for you to drink. If you want to go swimming, that's different. Well, I'd like to, Mr. Benny, but I can't swim. Well, you can go wading. And up to your neck, it's only 15 cents. Yeah, I lose a fortune on Gary Cooper. <laughs> oh, say, Mary, I knew I had something to tell you. What? You know the song I wrote when you say I beg your pardon and I'll come back to you? Yeah. Well, Snooky Lanson, the star of the Lucky Strike hit parade, is going to sing it tonight on This Is Show Business. No kidding. That's right. No wonder President Truman isn't going to run again. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis, what's my song got to do with President Truman? They would have blamed that on him, too. <laughs> Dennis, instead of being sarcastic about my song, let me hear the one you're going to do on the program. Okay. Hey, you over there, just harvest the rice. Don't eat it. <laughs> Go ahead, Dennis, sing, will you? Silver your gold 
there. So keep my love in your heart. Remember the love tales we told. For with my love in your heart, my darling, you will never grow. Don't be fretful or regretful that you will grow much too soon with a love dear to dream of dear you'll stay like a rosebud in June so keep my love in your heart Good, Dennis. Now, if you want to stick around, you can help me fix Hiya, up the... Hiya, kids. Oh, hello, Phil. Oh, hello, Phil. Well, well, clean out the old pool, huh? Getting ready to open for business, eh, Jackson? Yep. Say, Phil, would you like your job back again as lifeguard? Not after what happened last year when that fellow nearly drowned. What happened, Phil? Before I could save him, I had to buy a ticket to get in the pool. <laughs> well, Phil, I can't afford to pay you a lifeguard salary... Rochester, what are you doing? I'm testing the diamond board. <laughs> well, good, good. And when you're through with that, you can... Uh... Hey, Jackson, come over here a minute, will you? I got something I want to discuss with you. With me? Yeah. Well, look, Jack, I've got a dentist appointment. I better be running along. Wait a second, Mary. I'll just see what Phil wants. Oh, all right. What's on your mind, Phil? Well, it's about Bagby, my piano player. What about him? He's leaving my orchestra. No. Bagby's quitting your band? Why? He's going back to his old job. His old job? What was that? Professor of psychology at Heidelberg. <laughs> <laughs> Phil. Phil, you mean to stand there with that bottle in your hand and tell me that Bagby, your piano player, used to be a professor of psychology? Are you kidding? He's got one of the most brilliant minds in the country. You ought to see his degrees. He's got his A.B., M.A., L.L.B., Ph.D., and his S.Q.C.T.F. S.Q.C.T.F., what's that? San Quentin, class of 34. <laughs> Phil. He was voted the alumnus most likely to come back. <laughs> Phil. For a while, we thought he was going to graduate magna cum gas chamber. <laughs> Well, Phil, what are you worried about? You can get somebody to replace Bagby. Yeah, but that ain't what bothers me, Jackson. It's his piano, and he's going to take it with him. Well, for heaven's sake, can't you get another piano? Not one that makes ice cubes. <laughs> ice cubes? When you press the foot pedals, you get draft beer. I wondered why that piano said Stein instead of Steinway. <laughs> well, Phil... Jack, I've got to be going. I'll be late for the dentist. Wait a minute, Mary. I'll go with you. I haven't had my teeth cleaned in a long time. Okay. Phil, I'll discuss this with you later. Okay, Jackson. So long. So long. Come on, Mary. Let's go. I'm not going anywhere with you to take that frog off your head. <laughs> Is he still there? Right. <coughs> Get off. Get off. Okay, Mary. Let's go. Hey, Mr. Penny, was that a frog on your head? Yes. Gee, I thought your toupee was winking at me. <laughs> Well, it wasn't. Come on, Mary, let's go. Mm. 
Mary, which office is your dentist in? Oh, he's way down at the end of the... Say, Jack, isn't that Don Wilson coming out of that office? Why, yes, and he's got the quartet with him. Hey, Don, Don. Why, hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. Hello, Don. I didn't expect to see you here. I took the sportsman to see my dentist. Oh, yes. Hello, fellas. (laughs) Don, what's the matter with them? They all had to have a tooth pulled. (laughs) Don. Don, the four of them had to have a tooth pulled at the same time? That's right. I've never seen a quartet like that in my life. They all have colds at the same time. They have headaches at the same time. Measles at the same time. Yeah, now they're going home. It's their children's birthday. (laughs) How do you like that? Each one had a tooth pulled, huh? Yes, Jack, and in that condition, I don't think they'll be able to do the commercial on the show. Well, why not? Well, look at Marty's jaw. It's all swollen, and he sings the lead. But, Don, we have to have a commercial. I know, Jack, but with Marty's jaw swollen, people won't be able to tell what he's singing about. Well, let him try it and find out. Go ahead, fellas. Let me hear it now. Anytime you're feeling lonely, anytime you're feeling blue, Life's a time, collide a lucky, you'll enjoy your lucky stripe and stroll. Anytime you feel like smoking, here's the one we know you will like. So anytime at all, it's on the swing of fall. That's the time to light a lucky stripe. Anytime you light a lucky You'll enjoy your gratitude true. Lucky strike is better tasting. No loose ends. It is pretty bad, Don. <laughs> Lucky strike means fine tobacco. Lucky strike is the one you will like. Ask any old cowhand to name his favorite friend. That's the time you light a lucky strike. One o'clock. Two o'clock. Quarter to three. It's always LSMFC. Nine, ten. Anytime you like, it's time to light a lucky star. Well, Don, that didn't sound so bad. Maybe Marty will feel better by the time they have to do it on the show. Well, I hope so. Goodbye, kids. Goodbye. Jack, my dentist's office is down at the end of the hall. Oh, yes. I hope he can take me, too. While I'm getting mine cleaned, it wouldn't hurt me to have them checked for cavities. Well, here we are. May I help you people? Uh, Yes, nurse. I have an appointment with Dr. Foster. I'm Mary Livingston. Oh, yes. You're just in time. Go right in the first office on your left. Thank you. Uh, Miss, uh... While I'm here, I I want to find out about my teeth. Yes, sir. When did you leave them? (laughs) No. No, I'd like like Dr. Foster to examine them. Well, uh, Dr. Foster has no appointments open. However, Dr. Nelson has a cancellation. I'm sure he can take you. Well, good, good. I'll have to get some information first. Your name? Jack Benny. Occupation? A violinist. Oh. (laughs) Yes, I heard one of your concerts last summer. Oh, from the stage of the Philharmonic? No, from the diving board of your swimming pool. (laughs) Hmm. Now, your age, please. Well, uh... How... How old would you guess me to be? Twenty-eight? No. No, No, I'm a... I'm a little older than that. Uh, Guess again. (laughs) Sixty-one. For your information, miss, I happen to be 39. Oh. Yes, oh. Well, you'll have to wait a few minutes. Dr. Nelson is busy. You can sit right there and wait. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 
Oh, excuse me. Hi, Rube. <laughs> oh, hello. I, I haven't seen you for a long time. Well, I don't get to town much anymore. Oh, you still, still living in uh, Calabasas? No, couldn't stand the nightlife, so I moved to a smaller place. <laughs> you live in a smaller place than Calabasas? How big is it? Well, when four kids play Ring Around the Rosie, they circle the town. Well, that's really a small town, isn't it? You ain't kidding, Rube. What? They had to widen the street to put the white line down the middle. <laughs> hey. Hey, that's pretty good. Uh, by the way, I saw your last television show. You make a good-looking woman. Well, thanks, but I don't intend to dress like that again. You ought to. You ain't nothing the way you are. <laughs> Look, mister, I only sat Dr. down here... Dr. Nelson to... will see you now, Mr. Benny. Thank you. So long, Rube. Goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> Right through that door, Mr. Benny. Thank you. Oh, doctor. How do you do? <laughs> mm, uh, look, uh, doctor, I'd like to you have... You don't tell me you have a toothache. No, no, I don't have a toothache at all. I only want... Hey, just sit down and leave the rest to me. But, Doctor, all I want is... Doctor? Doctor, why are you strapping me in this chair? Well, the last time I pulled a tooth, I yanked you hard and threw the patient out the window. <laughs> oh, my goodness, did the tooth come out? All of them, he hit a fire plug. <laughs> now, look, Doctor, I don't need an extraction. <laughs> all I want you to do is examine my teeth. Yeah, very it. well, very well. Open your mouth, please. Ah... Uh... Wider. Ah. Uh. Wider, so I can look way back. Ah. Uh. There. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I can see everything now. <laughs> yeah, your teeth look fine. Good. But you better do something about that appendix. <laughs> appendix? And now, just hold still, and I'll complete the examination. Excuse me, doctor. Oh, yes, nurse? Uh, J. Howard McGrath is here from Washington. Oh, to have his teeth cleaned? No, sharpened. He wants to bite someone. <laughs> well, I'm busy right now. And, nurse, send in my technician. I have to make an x-ray. Yes, doctor. Hey, now, Mr. Benny, before my technician comes in, I just want to make one final check. Open your mouth. Uh, uh, doctor. Doctor, why are you spinning my pivot tooth? I used to be a disc jockey. <laughs> a disc jockey? And now I'd like to dedicate this next tooth for Billy, Mervyn, Manny, Jesse, and all the boys at Hickey's Bar, and happy birthday to Jeanette. Now, cut that out! <laughs> Look, I just came here for... Hey, a... you sent for me, Doctor. Uh, yes, I have a patient here who requires an x-ray Oh, very well You operate the camera and I'll swing the chair around So you'll get a good picture Is that the technician? He looks like a frog I met this morning <laughs> Well, he's my x-ray man And he's made some very good dental pictures Perhaps you've seen them They played all the neighborhood theaters Dental pictures? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, wrong molar. What? David and Bicuspid. Look, doctor. And the latest one with Montgomery Clift, a space in the gum. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Look, doctor, I haven't got all day. If your man is going to take this x-ray, let him take it. I'm going to take the picture. He's going to direct it. Direct it? Yeah. Now, now, tilt your head back, Mr. Benny, and on cue, open your mouth, raise your tongue, press it over toward your right cheek, smile. Look at what's then... going on here. Lights! Camera, roll them. Doctor. Don't move. We're trying for an Academy Award. <laughs> Look, all I wanted was a simple examination. I have the picture, Doctor. I'll have it developed in a minute. Hey, good. 
Hey, Mr. Benny, while we're waiting, just sit back and relax. Thank goodness. Hey, come in. Uh, should I sing now, Doctor? Uh, yes, Miss Bernard. Sing? Doctor, what is this? Yeah, our floor show. We can't afford magazines. <laughs> what? A floor show? When your sweetheart just sends a letter of good mind. What is this, anyway? It's no secret. Uh, you'll feel better if you cry. Doctor, who needs a floor show? When waking Look, Miss Burner. Miss Burner. The frog sounded better. I think it's real. Miss Burner, wait a minute. Look, wait a minute, Miss Burner. Wait a minute. Wait a minute! <laughs> oh, brother. Well, what did you stop me for? Miss, do you happen to know when you say I beg your pardon and I'll come back to you? No. Good, good. <laughs> well, here are the results of the x-ray, Doctor. Hey, let me see. Oh, yes, a wonderful picture. Doctor, what does it show? Hey, just a moment, just a moment. Hmm. According to this x-ray, you have an abscess. An abscess? Yes, it's sort of a pocket. Gee. Hey, it's nothing to be alarmed about. Finding a little pocket under a tooth is very common. Although yours is unusual. Why? It has money in it. <laughs> Look, doctor, if you think I'm going to stay in this chair... Now, now, settle down. It'll only take a minute. Oh, nurse. Yes? Uh, grab the patient by the hair and hold his head back. Yes, doctor. Whoops. Well, and grab him by the ear. <laughs> doctor, I only came here for an examination. Oh, that's doctor, all. Doctor, I, I want to have a word with you. Yeah, excuse me. Really? Are you sure? Yeah. Hey, then you'd better help me. Nurse, hand me my forceps. Forceps. Novocaine. Novocaine. Needle. Needle. Swab. Swab. Birds. Birds. Straight chisel. Straight chisel. Drill. Drill. Coat. Coat. Hat. Hat. Suitcase. Suitcase. Doctor. Doctor, what are you doing? Our lease is up. We're moving. What? <laughs> Come on, nurse. Doctor. Doctor, let me out of this chair. Doctor Nelson. Doctor Nelson, don't leave me alone. When your sweetheart sends a little Doctor, come back. Goodbye. At least give me some Novocaine. <laughs> Doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, the very best Easter gift of all is the support you give through Easter seals to children who need your help. These seals provide medical care, nursery centers, and many other things that are needed. So give and give generously to the Easter seal agency in your community, or send your contribution to crippled children, care of your local post office. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment, but first... Do you do da do da do da do you do da do da Be happy, go lucky, get better taste today. Friends, you can tear and compare and see with your own eyes how luckies are made better to taste better. From a newly opened pack, take a cigarette made by any other manufacturer. Carefully tear a thin strip of paper straight down the seam from end to end and gently remove the tobacco. In tearing, be sure not to loosen or dig into the tobacco. Now, do exactly the same with a lucky strike. Then compare. You'll see some cigarettes are so loosely packed they fall apart. Others have air spaces, hot spots that burn harsh and dry. But you won't find that in a lucky. Look at that perfect cylinder of fine, mild tobacco, so free of annoying loose ends that spoil the taste. Notice those long strands of fresh, clean, good-tasting tobacco, so firmly packed to smoke smooth and even, giving you a milder, better-tasting cigarette. Yes, friends, tear and compare. Prove to yourself that Luckies are made better to taste better. Then make your next carton Lucky Strike. Bum, 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 be happy, go lucky, go lucky strike today. Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. How things go at the dentist? What a crazy dentist. I came in, he says, how do you do? He has a crazy x-ray man. He has a girl singing songs in the office. He makes movies. Well, if it's that bad, why don't you change dentists? No, I think I'll just change writers. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> Brought to you 
by Lucky Strike, product of the American Tobacco Company, America's leading manufacturer of cigarettes. This is Don Wilson reminding you to listen to your hit parade with Guy Lombardo every Thursday night, presented by Lucky Strike. Consult your newspaper for time and station. The Jack Benny program has been selected as one of the programs to be heard by our armed forces overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Stay tuned for the Amos and Andy Show, which follows immediately. is the CBS Radio Network. From 72 years ago, April 6, 1952, Jack Benny. Visit our webpage, classicradio.stream. Oh, by the way, I mean, I wanted to mention this, uh, that uh, the J. Howard McGrath comment, J. Howard McGrath was uh, Harry Truman's attorney general in that year, and he was uh, uh, going after a lot of people over loyalty oaths and such, so... There you go. Visit our webpage, ClassicRadio.Stream. ClassicRadio.Stream. Uh, coming up next, the CBS Radio Workshop. Hello there. This is Jamamichi. You know, a single tree can make a million matches, but it takes only a single match to destroy a million trees. So be careful with matches. Make sure your match or cook fire is dead out every time. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. CBS Radio Workshop did a lot of uh, a variety of shows. You never knew when you were tuning in whether you were going to hear a comedy, whether you were going to hear drama, whether you were going to hear experimental stuff. And, and here's an episode entitled Speaking of Cinderella. Laureen Tuttle and Vincent Price star in this episode from April 6th. 1956 as they examine Cinderella. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Lorene Tuttle and I have been having a little argument as to the relative merits of... Having a little discussion regarding two different schools of literary thought. I've been maintaining to Mr. Price... You may call me Vincent. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Vincent. I've been maintaining that our whole lives are enriched by the warmth and beauty of romanticism. Romanticism, my dear Lorene, is for those weak, lily-livered individuals who haven't the courage to face the realities of life. Realism is life. Now, I'll take Eugene O'Neill any day in preference to Winnie the Pooh. And I'll take Cinderella any day rather than Hedda Gabler. Cinderella. Now, she's exactly what I mean. A smudge-faced juvenile delinquent, if you ask me. It's only one of the most beautiful fairy tales ever told. I defy any realist to tell such a moving story. Oh, you would, eh? Well, very well. To prove my point, I'll tell the real story of Cinderella. Very well, but ladies first. Please. To prove my point, I'll tell the romantic story of Cinderella. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System, and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, Ed Verdier and Don Clark's dramatic excursion into the realm of realism versus romance, as the workshop presents Speaking of Cinderella, or If the Shoe Fits, Starring Vincent Price and Loreen Tuttle. Special music composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. Vincent, are you listening? Once upon a time in a faraway country, there lived a lovely young girl named Cinderella. Unfortunately, she had a cruel stepmother and two stepsisters who were hard-hearted and ill-tempered. Poor Cinderella worked like a slave during the day. 
and in the evening she would sit alone in the chimney corner among the ashes. Now it happened that the king of the land was giving a ball, and all the people of rank and fashion were invited. Among these were Cinderella's two stepsisters. I'm really very well pleased that my two daughters have been invited to attend the king's ball. Oh, oh so, so are, are we, we Mama. Mama. It has been rumored that the king's eldest son, the prince, is to choose his bride from among the young ladies who will be present. Oh, the prince is so tall and handsome. So gallant and rich. And don't forget, one day his bride will become queen of the kingdom and will rule over all the subjects in the domain. Dear stepmother. What? Oh, it's you, Cinderella. What do you want? Dear stepmother, could I too go to the ball? What? You? Have you taken leave of your senses, girl? You have no clothes, only those tattered old rags you're wearing. There are ashes in your hair. Your shoes are broken and scuffed. With very little trouble, I believe I could make myself quite presentable. You were scullery maid, presentable. Well, I've never heard of such conceit. I beg of you, stepmother, a simple little dress. I could wear a flower in my hair. That would be all from you, you impertinent ragamuffin. Back to the kitchen. Do you hear me? Back to the kitchen this instant. (laughs) And so poor Cinderella went back to her chimney corner and wept bitter tears. She knew that Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now there's as fine an example of flapdoodle as I've been exposed to in my whole life. What do you mean, flapdoodle? This Cinderella character. By the way, you romanticists picture her, the poor girl needs an analyst. Oh! What on earth is she doing groveling around in the fireplace getting ashes in her hair? Nobody could ever be like that. Now, do you want to know what really happened? Well, I don't think so. It would do you good, Lorene. Facing reality, you understand. Well, this gal, Cindy, wasn't getting much of a break, but she didn't take it sitting down. She knew she had to play it smart. So when a rich man in town sent out bids for a big wing ding he was throwing, Cindy was all ears. I'm certainly glad you girls have been invited to Mr. King's party. It should be real nervous. Yeah, when he throws one, it's really a rocket. You can say that again. The last one we went to, I was hung over for three days. I read in somebody's column, Winchell's, I think, that the old man has given his son the word to get married and settle down. Get the possibilities? I understand the guy's quite a wolf. So what? And don't forget that someday he'll be a vice president of King Betancourt Bagby and wins one of the biggest advertising agencies in the world. No wonder they call him the prince. So, if one of you girls latch on to him, you'll have it made, but good. Hey, how about me crashing this bra? You, Cinderella? You must be blowing your stack. (laughs) Now I've heard everything. (laughs) Ah, go up on the roof and feed your pigeons. Knock it off, you two, or I'll belt your one in the teeth. Don't pull any of your lady wrestler stuff on my gal. I would have been a champ by this time if you hadn't made me throw those last two matches. I had gorgeous Gloria's shoulders pinned to the canvas when you... What are you beefing about? You got your cut? Yeah, then you took me for the whole bundle shooting craps. Look, do I make this party or don't I? You don't. Besides, you haven't got a thing to wear. You're loaded. You might part with a little grab. I could pick up a nifty little number at Orbach's for a few bucks. That's enough out of you, Cinderella. Get back to the kitchen and wash the dishes. And get the dried egg yolk off the plates for a change. Nah, don't give me that lift, that load, tote, that bail routine. I got other plans. Cinderella, where are you going? Down to Dirty Joe's Bar and Grill, that's where. That horrible, smelly dive down on the waterfront? I've smelled worse. But the dock workers are having labor trouble down there. You're... Don't worry your empty head about me, Steppy. I can take care of myself. Be seeing you. Oh, I have never, never in all my life heard anything so outrageous. <laughs> Vincent, you, you should be ashamed of yourself. 
Distorting that lovely story and making Cinderella such a horrible character. Well, at least she has spirit. She isn't the namby-pamby little goop you'd want the public to accept. My Cinderella is a charming child, unspoiled, sweet, and naive. Oh, she's naive, all right. She's so naive, she's simple in the head. She ought to be in an institution. That isn't true. She has all the personality of an oyster. Why doesn't she stand up for her rights? Because she's a dear, obedient child. Well, a good psychiatrist might help her, but I doubt it. Your Cinderella was trying to escape reality by indulging in daydreams about a fairy godmother. Fairy godmother? <laughs> it wasn't that way at all. You see, there really was a fairy godmother. You don't say. Yes. So, when her two stepsisters had left for the ball, dressed in their beautiful gowns, Cinderella went sorrowfully to the kitchen sat down in the chimney corner and broke into sobs of unhappiness. At this moment, a beautiful fairy appeared. <laughs> no, no, stop your crying, my child. I am your fairy godmother, Cinderella. If you wish to go to the king's ball, you shall. But you must do everything I say. Yes. Oh, yes, of course. First, bring that pumpkin out into the garden. Where shall I put it? Oh, right there. Yeah, that's right. Now, I'll touch it with my magic wand like this. And... There. Oh, my. A splendid coat, all gold and silver. Oh. Now, bring me those six mice in yonder trap. Yes. All right. But... What shall I do with them? Let's put them there, in front of the carriage. Yeah, that's it. So, a touch of my wand and... <laughs> Six white horses with golden harness and red and blue ribbons in their manes. Oh, fairy godmother, it's wonderful. Oh, well, my dear, is this not a fit equipage to take you to the king's ball? Indeed. Indeed it is, but... But... I have no suitable gown. All I have are these tattered rags. Oh, yes. We'll soon take care of that. Oh, how lovely. A white satin gown. Covered with pearls and diamonds. And tiny slippers of glass. Spun as fine as gossamer. How can I ever thank you, dear... Dear fairy godmother. By being happy. But hear me. There is one condition. You must not remain at the ball after the clock strikes twelve. If you do, your coach and horses will all return to their natural forms, and your fine gown will again turn to rags. Oh, I promise I'll leave the ball at the very first stroke of twelve. <laughs> then off with you, my darling, and have a merry time. You've been so good to me. So very, very good. And so, in all her finery, Cinderella started off for the king's ball, looking more like a princess than anyone would be there. Cinderella was very happy. Oh, what stuff and nonsense. Really, in all my born days, it I have never... It wasn't that enchanting, my dear. Enchanting? It was appalling. Appalling? Moreover, it doesn't make any sense. Cinderella's stepmother obviously has money. She thinks nothing of getting Dior and Adrian gowns for her daughters. But still, her place is overrun with mice and rats. Why, if the Board of Health You ever... are getting more odious by the minute. Odious, schmodious. Let's get back to reality. And the way the story really happened. Now, this Cinderella kid wants to go to the ball, all right. But instead of falling back on her schizophrenic escape pattern, why doesn't she do something constructive? Now, actually, she does. Such as what? Such as this. When Cinderella left her mother's house, she was pretty steamed up about the treatment she got. So, as she said, she went to Dirty Joe's down on the waterfront, where she could get a short beer and think things out. Hi, Dirty Joe. Hiya, Cindy. How are your pigeons? Joe, you know Crummy. Crummy? Yeah. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Crummy who? You know, Crummy McRodder. Oh, him. 
He comes in here all the time, doesn't he? Yep. You see him tonight? Yep. You mean he's been in? Sure. When did he come in? About an hour ago. Did he say where he was going when he left? Nope. How long ago did he leave? He didn't. Huh? You mean he's still here? Yeah, over there, in the last booth. Oh, thanks. I mean, thanks. Hi, Crummy. Hi, Bright Goyle. How's the pigeons? Mind if I sit down? What's to stop you? That sawed-off shotgun. Oh. I'm moving over here. Why the artillery? Things are tough on the water for right now, Bright Goyle. The boss wants us band boys to play soft, sad music as a warning to the dock wallopers who ain't kicking in. Yeah. Who's the target for tonight? Guy by the name of Gus Guggelheimer plays a glockenspiel. He run out on us. And what's on your mind, bright girl? Look, Crummy, I- I'm gonna put it right on the line with you. I need some dough. Oh, sure, who don't? I need a slick drape and a... I'm sorry, bright girl, you can't put the bite on me for nothing like that. I don't need much, Crummy, just a couple of C notes. Hey, what do you think I am, your fairy godmother or something? If you need some scratch, get it from your old lady. Ah, uh, she wouldn't give me a dime. That's too bad. Now, uh, the way I hear it, she keeps plenty of ice around the place. Hey, the wall safe. Come on, you got something there. You know how to crack a safe. You ain't just beating your gums, baby. I got ten years in Alcatraz to prove it. All right, then. Now, here's what we'll do. Listen. You getting it, Crummy? Will you shut up and leave me listen? One thing I... Got to remember. Yeah, what's that? Except for the bracelet I'm going to give you for this caper. I've got to put back all the rest of the jewels before midnight. There's a time lock on this safe, and it's set for 12 o'clock. I got it open. (laughs) Hey, there's plenty of loot in here. Wait a minute. Get your cotton-picking hands off that stuff. Oh, no. Here's a bracelet. Must be worth a grand at least. Uh, Give me two C-notes, and it's yours. Then you better add an extra sawbuck for cab fare. Well, here's a 200, but not another cent. I made a sucker deal, if you ask me. All right, all right. Don't give me the extra 10. I'll just have to heist a car to get to the party. That's all. Code 3, 768-4379-8HF22. Be on the lookout for a pumpkin yellow Cadillac convertible just stolen from the corner of 4th and Spruce Street. Repeating code 3768-4379-8HF22. You see what I mean? My Cinderella is a realist. She has spirit. Oh, really, Vincent? You know this whole thing is impossible. I don't quite agree with you. Your version of the Cinderella story is impossible. Mine is possible. But uh, continue, my dear. Well, I'm not sure that I want to, but I suppose I must if any semblance of dignity and decorum is to remain in this... Lovely story. (laughs) Well, when Cinderella arrived at the king's palace, she was surrounded by courtiers who led her into the ballroom. All eyes were directed toward her, for everyone was struck by her grace and beauty. No one knew who she was. Even her cruel stepsisters did not recognize her. So rich and splendid was her dress. All the king's courtiers, one after another, asked Cinderella to dance and they were all highly pleased with her grace and elegance, as well as enchanted by the wit and brilliance of her conversation. The prince himself arrived quite late. Seeing Cinderella, he so admired her appearance and manners, he immediately offered her his hand to the dance. What a charming creature you are. Tell me your name, I pray. That I cannot do, sir. And please do not press me to tell it. I am sure you must be a princess from a distant kingdom. Really? What makes you say such a thing as that? No one but a princess could wear as magnificent a gown as yours, encrusted with precious gems and jewels. And no one but a princess could be so beautiful and so beguiling. You will turn my head with the sweetness of your words, my prince. And indeed... What is that? It is the tolling of the curfew bell. 
What o'clock is it? Tell me quickly. It is midnight. I must go. I must leave at once. I beg you to stay yet a while, for you dance with the likeness of a butterfly on the soft summer breeze. I cannot stay. I cannot. My heart prompts me to tell you that I love you, for I have never seen a maid so fair. No. So... No, please let me go. Good night, my prince. My prince charming. Good night. In her haste to leave, my beautiful princess has left her slipper behind. A slipper of glass spun as fine as gossamer. I vow I shall find my lovely princess if I must search all the kingdoms of the world, for I would make her my wife. Now there's a real basis for a successful marriage. The prince has one dance with Cinderella. One dance, mind you, and he wants to marry her. Why not? I wonder what a marriage counselor would say about that. Must you be so literal? And she is such a bird brain, she runs off leaving one of her shoes behind. It was a slipper of glass, spun as fine as gossip. And those two stepsisters of Cinderella's, they can't be very bright. They're right there at the ball, and they don't recognize her just because she's wearing a new dress. Now, I ask you, what sort of an IQ would those two have? Now, you take my Cinderella. You take her, and you can have her. My Cinderella has moxie. She goes after what she wants. No fairy godmother nonsense about her. When she arrived at Mr. King's party, the place was really jumping. The minute she wiggle walked into the joint, all the cats began to yowl. What a load of a babe, wow. Hey, it's a doll, a real living, breathing doll. Hey, looky, looky, hiya, cookie. Ah, get away from me, short, fat, and repulsive. Come on, sweet mama, how about pinning on a jake? Let's live it up for real. Drop dead, cornball. What's with you, beautiful? You mad in this madman world? Mister, I'm just not playing the field, that's all. What I'm looking for is the favorite. Where's the prince? In the rumpus room, lapping up some corn squeezes, I suppose. Thanks, chum. See you around the polling alley sometime. Man, dig that crazy, crazy walk. Real cool, man. Cool. Yeah. Well, hiya, babe. You the character they call the prince? That's right. My old man is J. Walter King, a king, Betancourt, Bagby, and Wince. Sure, I know. You're in the advertising racket. Big deal. Hmm. You know something? You're okay. Sounds as if this advertising dodge pays off in blue chips. You mind if I park the bustle? My dogs are killing me. Yeah, sit right here next to me, doll. That's it. Would you like a slug gun? Yeah, I don't mind if I do. Uh, double bourbon on the rocks with a twist of lemon peel. There you are. I like you, sweetie. You're a real dish of stuff. Oh, it's the spot. Fill her up again, Buster. <laughs> you and your old men are throwing quite a bash tonight. Uh, entertaining the sponsors is what they call an occupational headache. Oh, yeah, I'll bet. Met a couple of the jokers when I came in. Well, here's mud in your eye, Prince. Cheers. That's a real sharp bunch of threads you're filling. Yeah, it's just a little something I picked up. And diamonds and pearls. Yeah, I picked them up, too. So you're the original man in the gray flannel suit, huh, kiddo? Ah, I suppose one of these days I'll make vice president. How come you haven't pressured your old man before this? He's just made me an account executive for Bimbo's No Bunion Shoes, but I think he's thrown me a curve. The radio and TV ratings are doing a nosedive. What you need is a gimmick, Princey. Ah, you can say that again. Come on, they're playing a rock and roll, and that's for me, sugar. Okay. Gimmick, I think. No giveaway, no panels. These kind of notes really send me. A gimmick that... Oh, doggone it. What's the matter, baby? I'm losing my slipper. Hey, wait a minute, Princey. Wait a minute. I think I got your gimmick. What's with you? You flipping your lid or something? Now, listen. I leave my slipper behind when I leave here tonight. Nobody knows who I am, so you put big ads in the newspapers and buy spots on radio and television. A coast-to-coast campaign, a big build-up in Ballyhoo to find the bimbo no-bunion shoe girl. You got it, Princey? Hey, I really think you got something there. <laughs> Jump, 
open catfish. Is that 12 o'clock? Sure is. The time lock on the wall safe. This stuff's got to be back there before midnight. I got to scram out of here. What are you yakking about? If I don't get going right now, I'm a dead pigeon. Uh, Here's my slipper. You take it from there. So long, Princey. Do you see how competent and constructive my realistic Cinderella has turned out to be? She's scheming and conniving and... Actually dishonest. She stole her stepmother's jewelry. Oh, nonsense. She only borrowed it for a little while. She's hurrying home right now to put it back in the wall safe. How about the bracelet she gave to Cummy? Don't you worry about my girl. She's ingenious. She'll find some way of getting around that. She's an uncouth, unprincipled creature. Well, at least she isn't inane and innocuous like your girl. But please, go on with your story. Thank you. The prince searched everywhere for Cinderella. But alas, he could not find her. And when his search had quite failed, he grew ill with disappointment and vexation. Then the king, who dearly loved his son, called a privy council and asked his ministers what was to be done. They decided to send out heralds throughout the kingdom, proclaiming that the prince would marry the lady who could wear the tiny slippers spun of glass as fine as gossamer. Ah, the slipper does not fit you, my lady. Oh, dear, I'm so disappointed, Prince. Let me try, sister. <laughs> I'm sorry. It does not fit you either. I felt so certain it would. Let the modest little girl who is standing back there come forward. Why, why it is you, my princess. Despite your modest garments, you cannot conceal your identity from me, for I see you through the eyes of love. Now, we'll try on the slipper. Yes, my prince. It fits. The slipper fits. Come to my arms, my darling, my own true princess. My prince. My prince charming. And so they were married and lived happily ever afterwards. Now, wasn't that a sweet and lovely story? To be perfectly frank with you, Lorena, I found it rather dull and pedestrian. Oh, Vincent. Well, in my version, there is action and excitement. My Cinderella is real and colorful. I suppose your story has a sordid ending like so many realistic stories. She probably went to the penitentiary and the advertising man was sent to the Chicago office. No, Lorena, not at all, not at all. Listen. This is your newscaster, Thomas Lowell. The search for the bimbo no bunion shoe girl continues. She has been reported seen in St. Louis, Altoona, and Tibet. Cinderella, turn off that radio. There are rumors that... I'm sick to death of hearing about that bimbo no bunion shoe girl. That's all you read about in the newspapers, all you hear on the radio, all you see on the television. And that singing commercial... Where is the bimbo girl and who is she with the no bunion shoe? Bunion shoe. Driving me nuts. Ah, Keep your hair on, kids. It'll be all over tomorrow. It's been the greatest search since Bridie Murphy. And, Dad, the ratings are neat, 43. The bimbo shoe sales are up 72.9. A terrific campaign. This makes you a vice president, my boy. I owe it all to you, Cinderella. Ah, it's okay, Princey. But when do we get hitched? Whenever you say, baby. We better see how soon we can line up the network so we can get full coverage. We want this wedding to be a real doozy. Bimbo's no bunion shoes will sponsor the whole works. I better let the press and photographers in. They're getting impatient. You're smooth, Cinderella. Cinderella. Real frantic smooth. Oh, and Princey, you're the most. Well, Vincent, at least you had a happy ending. Of course. You see, Lorene, there are all sorts of Cinderella stories. They happen every day, but they all end in exactly the same way. 
Even today, the beautiful girl can marry the handsome prince. And of course, they'll live happily ever after. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented Speaking of Cinderella, starring Vincent Price and Loreen Tuttle and directed by Don Clark. Original script by Ed Verdier and Don Clark. The cast included Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Louise Arthur, Gene Bates, Vic Perrin, Irene Tedrow, Harry Bartell, Sam Edwards, Peter Leeds, Jack Crucian, and Byron Kane. Original music for tonight's program was composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William Frug. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when we present Jacob's Hands, an original new story by Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood. And we are proud to welcome as our narrator the distinguished author, Mr. Isherwood, presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. Sunday, over most of these same stations, the New York Philharmonic Symphony will be heard playing the Brahms Piano Concerto No. 1 in D minor, with Guido Cantelli conducting and Rudolf Fierkuschny as soloist. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these stations by My Son G. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. you have it from 68 years ago april 6 1956 the cbs radio workshop uh tomorrow dean martin and jerry lewis abbott and costello fibber mcgee and molly dennis day and superman but right now an episode of the soap opera claudia friends this is jim michi about forty thousand lives a year needlessly lost the circumstances were traffic accidents, but, says the National Safety Council, the causes were human. Human failure to pay attention to the road and weather conditions, to slow down when needed, or even to care whether you arrive safely. Make safe driving your responsibility. All right, now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we wrap up this program with an episode of the soap opera Claudia, going back 76 years to April 6th, 1948. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you, transcribed, Monday through Friday, by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. Hello, hello. Oh, blasted, I've disconnected myself again. Hello, 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 hello. Is there an architect in the house? Huh, hello, hello. There are two architects in the house, and that's all there are. Why, Roger, you're sitting at the switchboard again. I certainly am. Where's Lottie? Lottie is home, taking care of her mother, who has a bad cold in her chest. Oh, is David here? David certainly is here. Hello, David. I'm here, too. A fine thing. Isn't a man's office sacred anymore? Well, if you're not glad to see me, Roger and I will walk right out and leave you here with a switchboard on your lap. (laughs) Who says I'm not glad to see you? Nobody says. And I am delighted to see you, Claudia. Take off your coat, madame. Mm -hmm. What kind of a freight terminal do you want us to build for you now? Uh, Sit down. Have a cigar. Oh, I don't smoke cigars. Gave it up last week. I thought you seemed different. Your face looks absolutely empty. That's a nice way to talk to a prospective customer. 
No wonder you've only got one freight terminal to build. One is more than enough. If only Carrington would come to New York, our one would be underway immediately. Instead, he only phones and things are endlessly delayed now. We're expecting to hear from him any minute. <gasps> That's awful. What's awful about it? Well, I was hoping you'd come and look at wallpapers with me. That's why I'm downtown. What uh, do we want with wallpaper? For the house in the country. Hmm. We hardly have a wall. That is the trouble with architects. No imagination. No imagination, eh? I suppose you've imagined something better than we have. I huh? certainly have. Have you ever seen how hard it is to put wallpaper on a wall? My new system does away with all that. David, we should listen to this very carefully. Occasionally, good ideas come from highly improbable places. Mm. All right. Let's hear it. What is the Claudia Brown Norton system? I put up the wallpaper first, mm -hmm. then paste the wall onto the back of it. Darling, it is visionary. What do you think of it, Roger? It is probably the greatest idea since the invention of the skyhook for hanging roof. <laughs> oh, yes. It's got striped paint beat a mile. You two sound like a vaudeville team. <laughs> Darling, can you come and look at the wallpapers with me? Well, I'd love to, but you see, Roger has to go to the bank, and we're expecting a call from Carrington, and somebody has to stay here to answer the phone. If I leave right now, you'll be able to get away sooner. See you very soon. Goodbye. I'll only be a few minutes. Goodbye, Roger. Say, David, the wallpaper place is right across the street. We'll go just as soon as Roger's back. In, in fact, we can go just as soon as Carrington calls. Good. I wish I could get him to come to New York. That's the only way we'll really get things ironed out. Oh, there he is now. Killian and Norton, good morning. Give me that telephone. Mr. Norton, who is calling, please? Hand over that telephone. Mr. Kelly, one moment, please, Mr. Kelly. I'll see if Mr. Norton is in. Mr. Kelly. You don't say. I don't know what he wants. Hello. Hello, Kelly, what's on your mind? The bid. What bid? It's due today? Well, I'll rush it right down there myself. Yeah, thanks, Kelly, for reminding me. What bid, David? We were bidding on a school job with Kelly, and it, now it looks like I'm going to have to rush it right down to the board. Would you like me to stay here? I'll talk to Mr. Carrington. Well, I hate to ask you to, but I think I wish you would. I don't mind, darling, if it'll help you out. Besides which, Mr. Carrington's a very nice man. We always have lots to talk about. Mm -hmm. Certainly is lucky you showed up. Now, where is that bid? I think it's over here on this desk. Look at all the mess on that desk. Honestly, Lottie isn't here for one day, and this place looks like... Well, it looks like an office with two men in it. I was sure I left it over here. I'll help you find it. What does a bid look like? It looks like an envelope. That's what it is, an envelope. Well, there are a dozen envelopes here. You sure it isn't one of these? It isn't. I looked. David, look at all the things you have on these desks. Newspapers and blueprints. And... What are these things? Uh, oh, specifications. Never mind them now. And look at all these advertisements and calendars. Don't you people ever throw anything away? Lottie's the admiral in charge of throwing things away around Would here. Would you like me to clean this mess up while you've gone? You can do anything you like when I'm gone. Only help me find that bid now. You sure it isn't one of these envelopes? I am positive. Uh, what's that one you have in your hand? It's one of the envelopes. Well, where did it come from? It wasn't there a minute ago. Uh, that's the bid, darling. Fancy, fancy. Now, give it to me. I, I, I haven't much time. Mr. Find it all? How long will you be gone? Oh, half hour at the most. The board is right near here. So long. I, I, I'd better hurry. Goodbye. Oh, David. Now what? Wait for the traffic lights. Yeah, I will. <sighs> Hello? Hello? Oh, hello, Mama. How's your cold? You sure it's better? Yes, I'm in David's office. And it's lucky I came because he and Roger both had to go out. No, I won't touch anything. Only I'm going to clean up the place while they're gone. Isn't it awful the way men leave an office when there are no women around? Oh, all kinds of papers. I'm going to put them in the safe and lock them up. Yeah, I thought it was a sensible idea, too. I'll speak to you later. Goodbye, Mama. 
Take a newspaper and do a crossword puzzle. One horizontal, six letter word meaning South American tree. Oh, for heaven's sakes. One vertical, Siamese coin. 97 horizontal, Turkish nobleman beginning with E, four letters. Let's see now. This is the most foreign puzzle. Hello. Hello, Roger. You're back quickly. Only 20 minutes. Where's David? Did Carrington call? He hasn't called yet. David had to take a bid someplace. A bid? Yeah. Oh, you must mean a school job bid. Oh, I thought that wasn't due till tomorrow. That's what David thought, too. But Mr. Kelly called up and David had to go rushing out. Well, it's a lucky thing you were here. Uh, Roger. Hmm? Do you notice anything Different? Different? Oh, yes. All those papers. You cleaned them all up. That was nice of you, Claudia. It certainly makes a difference, doesn't it? A wide expanse of desktop. <laughs> What's Mr. Carrington going to call you about? You never did tell me. Well, we hope it's for a last-minute checkup on the specifications. Oh? He's just about ready to put the freight terminal out for bidding. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Did uh, Carrington call? No, not yet. Did you win? Win what? Win the bid, of course. We, uh... We don't know yet. Well, if you don't know yet, then what was the big hurry? Uh, Roger, mm. you you uh, explain it to her, will you, while we try to figure out why Carrington hasn't called yet. Well, wh what time is it? Let's see, I have uh, quarter after one. Quarter after one? Well, it's an hour earlier in Chicago. We mustn't forget that. Mm. David, you didn't even say thanks for how nice your office looks. Well, it looks empty. <laughs> <gasps> That all the thanks, I guess. <laughs> oh, that's Carrington now. Do you want to talk to him, or shall I? No, 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 no. You, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, this is uh, Killian and Norton. Chicago calling? Uh, yes. Yes, I... Yes, I'll take it myself. It, it, it must be Carrington. Now, you talk to him, David, while I find specifications. Now, they must be here somewhere. Fine, fine, fine. No. Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Norton. Yes. Yes, I'll speak to Mr. Carrington. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Carrington. David, do you have those papers? Uh, uh, ec uh excuse me a moment, Mr. Carrington. Haven't, haven't you got them? I think they're here on the table. Claudia, where did you put the specifications that were on the table? I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carrington. I'll, I'll be with you in just a moment. I cleaned up everything and put everything in the safe. Oh, no. You locked it. I don't know the combination. Do you, David? Me? I thought you did. I, 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 I keep it written down. But I keep it in the safe. Oh. Well, try something. Try anything. Come over here and help me, David. Uh, Claudia. Claudia, here. You take the phone and start talking. What about? Uh, here. You had to clean the office. Uh, one moment, please. I think. I think. Oh, it starts with... Seventy-five, three times to the left. To the left? I, I thought it was to the right. That's th this way. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Carrington. This is Claudia Norton. Yes. Well, <clears throat> you must come to New York, Mr. Carrington. It doesn't open. Uh, Claudia, keep talking. I'm sure I it am, goes to I the am. left. Seventy-five. Oh? Seventy-five. Seventy-five. Yes, 75. Mr. Carrington. Oh, wait a minute, you passed it. You got to pass the number. That's the uh, secret of it. Well, well, we'd love to see you again, Mr. Carrington. We just bought a house in Connecticut, and we're going to have a cow. Well, we'll it's a real old salt box. Once more. Now. Yes, turning, yes. Turning yeah, yes, Mr. Carrington, with 78 time. acres and a brook. Three and times to the left and twice to the right. David, I'm running out of things to say. That never happened before. Say anything. Oh. It won't open, David. You try it. You try but it of course I mean it, Mr. Carrington. We'd love Please to have you come to New York. And then maybe you'll come off to Eastbrook with us and look at the house Wait and... A what am I saying? Three times to the right. That's right. Twice to the left. That, that's it, that's it. Forty 
Hey, is it coming? Oh, it yes, Mr. Carroll. Oh, Claudia had to tidy up things. I don't see why she couldn't have put the safe away and left the papers where they were. I have been intending to throw this, th- 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 this thing away for many years. Yes, Mr. And Carrington, now... that's wonderful. Goodbye. Roger. Roger, I think we've got it. I, I heard something click. Take it easy, David. Be, be very careful. It's the crankiest old safe in the world. Now, let's see here. Forty-seven. That's it. Forty-eight. That's right. Forty-nine. There. There. Oh, there they are. There they are. Right on top. The specification. You talk to him, Roger. No, no, you go ahead, David. You talk to him. But he's gone. He's gone? Who's gone? Mr. Carrington. He hung up. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, dear. You mean you ran out of things to say? I mean he decided to come to New York next week in person. And you know the funniest thing, he seemed to have forgotten why he called while he was talking to me. That I can understand. He's coming to New York? Well, that's marvelous. That's just what we were hoping for. Naturally. Naturally. Uh, Naturally. And now I am putting these specifications in this fine old safe. And then I'm locking it. And then I'm taking my two partners out to lunch. Shift your packages to the other arm, ma'am, when that bright red cooler hits your eye in the local food store. Stop for a few minutes, treat yourself to ice-cold Coca-Cola, and it'll be a lot pleasanter to go about your business. Stands to reason, you shop more comfortably when you shop refreshed. Hello there, Mr. King. Well, if it isn't Mr. Killian, you had quite a time getting that safe open, I see. But uh, I suppose you should feel lucky that the safe didn't have one of those time locks on it. You'd still be waiting to get in. A time lock and Claudia? The combination is too much for me. She's a charming girl, but I don't think she ever got anywhere on time in her life. Claudia and David are going to have dinner with Aunt Louisa tomorrow night, you know, Mr. Killian. And uh, I understand that Aunt Louisa runs her house as punctually as a railroad. Bet you 20 cents, as Claudia says, that she and David don't arrive at the right time. If they don't, well, I think I'll be listening to hear the consequences. And so will I, Mr. King. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Killian. As I was about to say, every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you, transcribed, with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Is that a chicken man plug? No. Uh, April 6, 1948, 76 years ago. Claudia here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. If you're listening on YouTube, visit our webpage, classicradio.stream. We don't get paid anything by YouTube. I like to stress that every so often. So uh, if you'd like to support us, you can buy me a copy. That's over at classicradio.stream. ClassicRadio.stream. Tomorrow, more comedy with Dean and Jerry, uh, Abbott and Costello, Pepper McGee and Molly, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, and Superman. We will see you tomorrow. Have yourself a great Saturday. Classic Radio Theater, I'm Wyatt Cox.